Good afternoon, good evening, good night for most of you around the world. It is 1.32 p.m. on the East Coast in Chicago. Welcome to The Big Debate. I'm your host, uh, Harry Fun, usually known as Tres Catos. The topic of today is education. No secret that education has the power to change a life. What is new is the demand for that change. Governments are investing more than ever before on educating their citizens eager for them to compete in the global workforce. A growing global middle class is spending more of its own money on educating their families. Employees are looking for a new sort of colleague, someone with the skills to flourish in the 21st century, combined with technologies that continue to develop at breakneck speed. It is the, result, the result is a world that has the wants and the means to learn at that scale. Yet there is so much to be done. So many million children around the world do not know what it feels like to step into a classroom. Many millions more are in education, but not learning effectively. The global challenge for education is not just about providing access, but also ensuring progress. Tonight, our focus is the, Cameroon, the Cameroonian educational system. With me is my co-host, Elizabeth Akaya. Thank you, Elizabeth, for joining the big debate. And I'll let you introduce the panels that will be taking part today. Thank you, Mr. Harifan. Thank you, Dr. Nikolai. I'm very happy for being with us this evening. I'm going to go ahead and start with uh, Dr. Nicolene. She's a speaker, an educator, and the number one best-selling author of several books. She taught in several elementary schools and colleges and universities across Canada and the United States for over two decades. Dr. Ambe's primary mission is to help parents raise high-achieving children. Through her speaking engagements and other forms of activities, she's been able to develop great relationships with children and with, with parents across different disciplines. And Harry, introduce Roland for us. So uh, Roland Fomunda is no stranger to the platform. He has been on the big debate platform before. Uh, when we talked about uh, setting up business, setting and doing, up bis uh, doing business in Cameroon. He is the CEO and founder of Greenhouse Ventures Limited. Um, he is also a cha the chairman of the Youth Action Africa. He has traveled across Africa trying to impact um, uh, the youth of Africa to get involved in agriculture, the future, um, the future of, uh, of, of tomorrow, the, Af the African economy. So Roland has a big role in playing and trying to see how we can we could change uh, the, the current education sector to broaden our, um, our, our scope. Um, uh, uh, like Elizabeth said, we have uh, Dr. Tata, uh, who, who's a PhD uh, fellow in uh, fiber, uh, fiber optic. He just joined us right now. So once we bring him up live, we will be to um, introduce. Uh, so I, I would let Elizabeth go with the first question. Okay, sounds good. I think I'm going to direct that question to Roman because um, he has more of uh, Cameroon exposure and he's been there, you know, several times he's worked in the system and he's more familiar with the system more than uh, some of us on the panel. So Roland, over to you and Dr. Nicolin, feel free to chime in as much as you can and whenever you feel it's necessary. So Roland, I'll start with you. What is your overall assessment of the Cameroon educational system, you know, with respect to the programs, the policies, the structure? And, uh, you know, you don't need to go into too much detail because we're going to come into those, into that, um, you know, in a more specific way. But just give us an overall assessment from your perspective of the system uh, today. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. It's a little rainy here, so I just wanted to make sure. Anyways, uh, uh, thank you all for having me. And uh, it's a great pleasure for me to be 
of course, on the panel with uh, Dr. Ambe, someone I admire very much. And uh, to you all for, uh, for organizing this, this wonderful uh, session. Well, the, the question is a very fundamental one. And of course, like uh, the moderator mentioned in the beginning, education is a fundamental tool when you're looking at how you can reform an entire economy. And of course, Cameroon is no stranger in terms of development. But we have several issues going on, which of course, education is very much one of them. The Cameroonian education system, we would not say is the very best. There is still a lot of room for improvement. Uh, as much as it, it, it plays a very big role in, in providing the basic education for a lot of uh, citizens, there are the fundamental aspects which I believe that uh, are still missing in it. Uh, three main things that I would consider every uh, education system to be optimum. You have access, you have quality, and you have relevance. Um, if you look at those three aspects, uh, you will realize that, of course, Cameroonian uh, education curriculum seeks to address them, but not in depth that we do need them to be. And that's why you will realize that over 80% uh, of the population has access to education, but of course you have over 90% of those who graduate still remain uh, unemployed. Uh, it's a very big problem because our education does not translate to, to employment or does not translate to uh, development, which is so, certainly something that has to be addressed by the reserves and its quality. So I think uh, uh, of those three elements, uh, access certainly seems to be uh, the most optimum, but relevance and the quality of it is still something that needs to be worked on. And uh, in one of those ways in which we continue to get involved to see how we could add to those areas. Okay, and I just uh, thank you very much, Roland. I just have one um, other question in relation to that before Nick, uh, Dr. Nicolin can can jump in if she needs to. Um, do you think the uh, what we have now is relevant to the economy, and does it in any way fit the needs of the country? Well, you, we, we we cannot totally dismiss it. Um, but of course, like I said, there's still a lot of room for improvement. Uh, our education system, from my own point of view, it is not uh, adapted to the current economy at the moment. Um, there are still a lot of gaps. Uh, the curriculum is to, to educate those who go on to remain bureaucrats. But if you understand how development has taken place in several economies, you have needed the role of the private sector, of the entrepreneurs, of those who think out of the box. And that is what we really do need right now. The curriculum that wants us to memorize and cram things so we can regurgitate when we're being asked, it's almost invalid at the moment. Mm -hmm. That which is needed is that which enables us to have to think out of the box and use innovative ideas to create innovative solutions for the world that we're going to live in today and tomorrow. Uh, Dr. Nicolin Ambe, do you have anything to add to what our brother Roland has just um, laid out? Absolutely. And he shared some wonderful, great points. And before I begin, I want to thank each of you for welcoming me here today. Roland, it's such a pleasure to share this stage with you. I see your amazing works and mm -hmm. you're someone who has actually used your education for something good. And you prove, you've proven, <clears throat> excuse me, you've proven that we don't necessarily need to go to school to learn about specific <laughs> things, but the things that we do know, we can translate them <laughs> to actually get stuff done, and get work done that can change the community. So thank you for your amazing work. You inspire me and you inspire a lot of us. Thank you. And for those of you who don't know me, I um, just want to share a little bit about myself to put everything in context. My name is Dr. Nicolene Ambe. I am a product of the Cameroon educational system. I went to primary school in Cameroon. I went to Our Lady of Lords. I went to um, high school in Yaoundé, and I graduated from the University of Yaoundé with a law degree. And when I completed my degree, I went on to Canada to study a master's degree and a PhD degree. I completed those and with a scholarship from the Canadian government. And after completing my degree, I went on to teach. I taught law for 10 years, 
before becoming an elementary school teacher. So now I'm a special education teacher. I teach societies little less once. So I often like to say I went to school and never left. And I've been in the field of education my entire life and I feel very comfortable in it. And I feel that um, I have some ideas that I would love to share with you here today. And after teaching for a couple of years, um, I started to work in the field uh, through speaking and teaching parents about how to empower their children at home to become high achievers in school. And so I've been in this field for a really long time. But I think that uh, we cannot talk about the education system in Cameroon. We cannot talk about educational reforms without actually addressing the, the government's desire to make the change, without actually addressing the quality um, of government interventions, without addressing the effectiveness of government structures and the desire for the government to make a change in that system. So it's fundamental and it's, it's important that we address the government's willingness to make that change. And a number of people have proposed curriculums and proposed uh, measures and strategies that would be effective in implementing the things that the society needs to compete in the global market. But it's apparent that the government is not willing to look at those suggestions. And so without that willingness, it's hard for us to implement any important educational reforms that will make a difference for our people. And there's also the issue of inefficient and insufficient distribution of resources based on income, based on disabilities, region, and at the governmental level. So it's very important that we look at the role that government plays in effectively um, proposing educational solutions for our people. And if the government is not willing to do that, I don't think that there's anything we can do with these ideas. But in an ideal world, um, we can have this conversation about uh, the, the proposals and the solutions that will help. But you know, if the government is willing to make that change, that we can't go anywhere with these ideas, but we can certainly discuss them. And the other important thing that I'd like to share is that there's so many of us, Roland is here, who has been a product of that system. Elizabeth, you have been, Harry, you have been, there have been so many amazing, brilliant minds who have come out of that educational system and who are making an amazing difference in the world. There's so many medical doctors, there's so many engineers and architects and amazing Cameroonians who are working, doing amazing things in the world and they are a product of that system. So therefore the system also, as Roland said, has some advantages as well that we need to look at. And I think that if you can come out of that system as inadequate as it is and become uh, effective and good, then we can learn from that. Uh, we can What we can learn from that is that education, we don't go to school for the sake of going to school. We go to school to learn our ABCs and one, two, threes, and then use that information to make a difference to act, to do, to work. So um, we don't necessarily need to have a perfect system, but the people have to be willing to use what they know to to act, to make a difference. Does that does that make sense? Yeah, definitely. So that's yeah. those that's what I want to share with you here today. Yeah, I use one keyword inadequate. <laughs> And I think that is a, 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 a perfect representation of what we have in in, in Cameroon. Um, right. You know, we 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 a lot of us went through difficult curriculums, I would say, and uh, we were still able to, you know, model our way through and then come out and be successful individuals in society, and we're doing great things. And one of one of the great minds just joined us, Dr. Tata, all the way from China. Um, Harry, if you don't mind, go ahead and introduce your man for us. <laughs> I cannot hear you, it's Harry. Can you guys hear him? Can you guys hear Harry? I cannot hear him. We can't can. hear him. Yeah, I can't hear him. Okay, let me go ahead and introduce Dr. 
because that's our for the benefit of those who are online. We don't want to keep them waiting. Uh, Dr. Tata is uh, a last minute addition that we had to add to the panel. But uh, we believed we, after we you know, went through some basic background check, uh, <clears throat> came to a conclusion that he was going to be a valuable addition to this to this panel because he comes with experience from both an educational perspective and as somebody who is trained in a field that Cameroonians are not training. And I'm, of course, I'm not trying to belittle all the fields, but you, you, know, you want to talk about somebody who has a PhD in engineering, physics, and all of that, then we have to applaud him for that. So Dr. Tata is a researcher and senior lecturer of engineering education at the University of Ghana and the University of Education in Winneba, Ghana. He holds a PhD in fiber optic engineering from the electronic science and technology of China. He has a lecturer and visiting lecturer in different systems for the past 17 years. He instructor in, the, in many Central African programs, and that includes, you know, back and the GCE, which, you know, is uh, programs that we have in Cameroon. West African programs like WAEC, which I, you know, I don't know too much about, but you can enlighten us somewhere down the line as we go along. And American programs like AP1 and C, SAT1, SAT2, UK programs, and all the like. He currently is a USA International AP Examiner for Engineering Physics. Now, some real background there, Dr. Tata. We are very happy to have you on here today. And uh, before you came on, we were on the very first question. And the very first question was just for us to give an appraisal of the uh, current educational system in Canada. <coughs> you know, if we think it meets it meets the current needs of the, the of the economy, if it's relevant in terms of the structure, the programs, policies, just a general perspective of it. If you want to go ahead. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'd really like to thank all of you for having me. And uh, I really also want to thank you for <laughs> making the decision to add me to the panel, even though uh, you had your program and uh, I just kind of... Uh, got to know about it within a very short space of time, and then you accepted to to let me take part in the program. I do appreciate that. Um, well, uh, talking about the Cameroonian uh, educational system, just uh, an overview of it. Uh, as somebody earlier indicated, sometimes you, you, you want to appreciate something by finding out how, how, how the, the, the government or the state um, spends on it. If you look at across uh, Africa, if you look at across Africa and other countries, uh, third world countries around the world, you find out how much they spend in education. It will give you a reflection. Uh, Cameroon, in a particular case, spends uh, just about 16.42% of uh, our GDP on education. Um, a country like uh, Ghana spends about 29, 29%. So that tells you that Ghana gives uh, a little more attention to education. So the results will definitely be, be, be very obvious. Uh, in the case of, of Ghana, you realize you expect to have uh, more, more results. And uh, you, you also notice that if you, if you look at the educational system in Cameroon, you see they, they've identified themselves. Uh, I was reading a document recently on the, the, the strategies, so to, uh, 2020 strategies, uh, which they, they have with respect to what they are expecting by 2020. The program actually was running from 2013 to 2020. And uh, you, you, the goals they've set for themselves, the challenges they've identified, and um, some of the strengths of the, of the program, though the document was completely in, managed to, I managed to grab a few things on it. And uh, I can note that um, an aspect as uh, one of our, one of you indicated, an aspect like inclusive education was uh, completely left out. Um, they, they didn't seem to give a little uh, emphasis on inclusive or even integrated education because most often than not, educational systems will start from integrating the educational system 
by trying to make sure that they think of uh, students with special needs, even if they have to be in another environment, they at least give them some attention. And then moving on to the next stage, which is going to be inclusion, which means that uh, both the students with special need and the students without special need uh, needs could be in the same learning environment and deploy technologies and other educational tools to make sure that these students all achieve the objectives as the state uh, claims to be. The, if you even go into the law that that that, that provides <laughs> the legal back, the law that provides the legal backing for education in Cameroon, <laughs> you would notice that in the constitution, the, the the state itself is trying to avoid the human right aspect of it. Um, by, by, by trying to avoid the fact that uh, education is a human right, uh, it's, 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 it's human right, uh, and then they, 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 they have the sole responsibility, they have the responsibility to provide, to ensure, to ensure that every child gets to learn. So um, what I'm trying to make here is that if you look at the behavior, if you study the behavior of the state, it wouldn't be very surprising it wouldn't be very surprising to uh, to have the results we're having right away, right now. However, uh, I'm a product of uh, of the, the system. Um, some um, I'm not sure how the system really um, the quality is at this particular moment. But um, as the board keeps migrating, because you see, if you look at the examination board, uh, if you look at the politics which is surrounding the examination board, you will understand. The reason why um, there is this perception that the, the the quality of the education is is actually ra uh, rather going down. If you look at the statistics, you would notice that the quality is actually going down. So, um, summarily, there are other specific things we will probably be discussing as we go ahead. But uh, summarily, uh, that is what I can say about the, the education system in Cameroon. Thank you very much for that. Um, Harry, are you back? Can we hear you now? Hello, Harry. He must be having some real technical difficulties with his audio. Okay, let's move on to the next question. And uh, this one, we're going to go to more specifics, and it has to do with um, some of the problems, because before we start proposing solutions and reforms, we have to be able to identify some of the problems. I know a lot of people are gonna say, oh, we know what the problems are, but you know, layman's perspective of a problem might not necessarily be an expert's opinion of a problem. So let's go into specifics here. Um, and I'll start with you, Dr. Bay Nicolin here. What do you think are some of the problems in our system today? In Cameroon? I think the one problem that's predominant is the centralization of education. Designing educational uh, solutions as if the community is homogeneous, as if we're the same. And I think that that system has to be decentralized to reflect the socioeconomic realities of the different parts of the country. So the educational system in the Northwest and the Southwest cannot look the same as the educational system in Yaoundé, uh, you know, in the central province, because they are two different people. So I think it's important, first of all, to decentralize and allow the local communities and the local region to create curriculums that reflect their reality so that they can grow um, from that. And I think that a lot of solutions have has been put forth that the government is not willing to take into consideration. And that's the first challenge. Okay. And the second challenge, I'll keep going. And I think right. the second challenge too is government appointment <laughs> of educational delegates or ministers and a, a lot of the people who are appointed are, poli are based on political <laughs> motives, not based on their skill and talent and effectiveness, whether they've been in the classroom <laughs> or not before, they've engaged with teachers, 
um, a lot of the appointments are not based on on skill and talent and expertise. And so these people are not able to make effective decisions that uh, will positively impact the educational sphere. And then the people who work underneath them, who are actually, who have actually been in the classroom, who've taught before, who know student um, psyche, are not able to be motivated to work under a boss who doesn't understand that. <laughs> So those are some of the issues that we need to look into. Okay, great. Um, Roland, if you want to chime in and you have anything to add to that. So we're looking at the problems of the system, I'm sure. Well, uh, yes, um, very much. I, I, I have a little bit of a, a different approach so looking at the problem, uh, my first side of it is that uh, we have to be involved in the education aspect itself. What do I mean by this? Uh, I believe that we have become a citizen that has been so dependent on a system mm -hmm. and a system that, of course, has not satisfied everyone, but we keep expecting um mm -hmm. that system to satisfy us mm -hmm. uh that's that over dependent on a system that of course um is proven to be weaker than stronger is also a problem that is more internal than external uh that's one and you'll realize that today in the world those who are the most successful are not the most educated mm -hmm. so we may be here um looking at education as the key to make everything happen, but maybe our over-dependence on that is actually making us not to see the other side of how we could do without. Um, China and most of Asia is today, not because of the very lengthy uh, education curriculum that, um, like what we're having, but mm -hmm. at one point, they transformed their curriculum towards catering for the manufacturing and the growing industries. And they made sure that they could have short-term degrees, which are like six, six months, where you get in, you get a job, and you get out. Uh, we still have a system that tells you you have to go to school for 18 years to become anybody. Uh, to me, no matter how fancy you make that look, it is still a recipe for a dead end. Um, I, I am of the opinion that we need to, first of all, even change the way we we, we, we we respond to our own education system. That's one. The other aspect is um, for us to be involved. Who uh, maybe uh, mentors some of us who had the exposure that we've had in other places. I believe that it's also our role to be able to include or introduce ideas that could also lead this going forward. Uh, many a times when we remain on the other side of bureaucracy and just uh, give all these innovative ideas and solutions. Of course, remember that we, we have to know that we are talking to a government that is probably not so responsive to the issues that cater for this particular age and this generation. So on one side is making sure that we can address problems that are fixable and problems that are, of course, are sustainable. There are problems, um, like every other place, but which mm -hmm. are the problems that we can resolve? I, I believe that those are the things that we can start to look at and see how mm -hmm. we could also get involved in making sure that we are part of a solution. Exactly, exactly. Um, just to add, there, there's no perfect system in the world. Even some of the most advanced economies like America and uh, England and Canada, they go through educational reforms every, you know, all the time. They introduce new, new uh, resolutions into the Senate and the Congress, or whatever you call them, and you see all these politicians debating on what's, you know, what makes sense and what doesn't make sense. And also, I believe every, I think that every system has a problem, and it's just a matter of and if those problems are actually the problems that we face, and if the solutions that we come up with are solutions that are going to benefit us and what is going to benefit us the country. Um, is Dr. back? Uh, one uh, one second, Elizabeth. Uh, uh, since I joined, uh, sorry for the uh, technical uh, issues. Uh, 
Um, I could hear you guys all for some brilliant ideas. Uh, Dr. Tata is off right now. He wasn't able to hear Roland, so I asked him to log off and then log back, uh, log back on. Um, I, I just want to throw this question out there, and, and this is because Roland brought in a, a, a different perspective of seeing the problems that uh, Dr. Dr. Nicolene actually put forth. That uh, we need to have a willing government um, uh, that needs to be able to produce, needs to be able to. Uh, assist the people to put it out there. And then in, in, in Roland's counter defense, it was that um, the people also need to push up. The people also need to take drive and, and do their own possible bet. Mm -hmm. But the current state of affairs, the way Cameroon is, is it a country that is ready to compete educationally? I mean, we don't take, we, we, we take no bone. We know that the, the, the products, the people of the Cameroonians themselves are very smart. We look at the, the, the positions they hold across the world intel, intelligently, uh, as, as intelligent as they are. I want to ask the educational system of Cameroon, can you compare it with, the, with, with other emerging economies around Africa? We want to keep it within the Africa, not comparing it with the likes of the US and Canada. Um, um, and Roland, you're on the ground. Let me start with you. <laughs> you, we, uh, the global market is a competitive environment, so we, we have to be able to compete and we have to be able to produce the best products. So when you look at that educational system, you talked of 18 years, I have to go through primary school and I have to go through university. Does Cameroon make products that are ready to compete with the likes of Nigerians and Ghanaians and Rwandese and, 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 and Moroccan and Egyptians? South Africans, that's the market we're looking into. Does Cameroon make those kind of products? And not individually, but collectively. I think Roland well, is going um, Okay, he's on. Okay, go ahead, Roland. Can you, can you hear me? Yes. 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 No, I no, I, I hear you very well. And that's, uh, that's, a very, uh, that's a very pertinent question. Of course, Cameroon has not yet attained that level of... Uh, a continental competitiveness, uh, which I can attest to that. But of course, one thing that Cameroon has, which is an asset, is the intellectual capital. If you look around the world today, amongst leading organizations, you will find out there are a lot of Cameroonians who are actually leading a lot of initiatives. And these Cameroonians, most of them are folks that are educated uh, from the same system that we, got, we are coming, that we're going through at the moment. Uh, which has to say something. There is something that has actually worked uh, for what we have at the moment. Mm -hmm. But in terms of the status quo we have uh, as of right now, and in terms of if we are being competitive with the rest of the continent, we are not there yet. Mm -hmm. I don't think we have those numbers, but in look around, Cameroonians are amongst mm -hmm. one of those uh, mm -hmm. countries with leading entrepreneurs that are champion in certain areas uh, in several industries. So of course, um, there is there is some things that we are getting that are right. Uh, it may just be a matter of time for us to really be able to get that threshold that would give us uh, maximum uh, impact uh, within the spheres that we are involved in right now. But uh, I would say that no matter how small we could be having uh, a, a, an impact within the uh, continental context, um, it is never too small because we we are just getting started with that, and there are many ways that would grow to achieve some uh, continental momentum as we would have to. And you realize that a lot of those uh, Cameroonians who are actually in position to make those strides are those who are not so educated. Uh, so but the call that I am trying to address here, which is that maybe. Uh, this formal education has become even more limiting than we uh, think it should be. Because if you realize amongst many others, uh, you realize that those with a more informal education are making greater strides than those with formal education. And maybe we have to start looking at the other side and saying, hey, maybe we have to uh, see how we can promote this other side of education then keep believing that, well, what... Um, has worked in Ghana, must work in Cameroon, must work in, um, in other parts of the world. So I, I think that, that, that there just needs to be a different perspective to what we have. And once we have that perspective, we'll be able to see many other values of it that we can count on. 
Thank you, Roland. Thank you for that. And Dr. Nukulin, the same question goes to you, but I want to throw in a caveat. Um, in, 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 I think I got a sense, and, and Roland can clarify after this, but I want to use what he just said to throw that question at you. But I, I, what I want to know is, he, he talked about Cameroon is not there, but we're making strides. Like, we're moving at a, at a I don't know, a snail's prog, a steps, right? So there, there's, there, there's, a, there's a light down the tunnel. But I, I, do you see it as a glass half empty or as a glass half full? What would be your take on this? We are, we are not there, but we, are, we, we cannot negate the little progress that we are making. Are we hungry enough of a country to compete with these other regional neighbors? As Roland said, we're not, but we're, we have the capability. We're capable of doing it. And the uh, success stories of so many Cameroonians who are doing amazing things around the world has proven that the system uh, we, we can do with what we have. And Roland himself has proven that you don't need to have uh, you know, all these degrees to be successful. And so um, it is what it is. Um, a lot of Cameroonians are very enterprising. We are a very resilient people, very hardworking, very um, forward thinking. So I know a lot of Cameroonians who are doing amazing things with what they have. So just like Roland said, uh, we have to continue to reteach and retrain our minds in a different kind of education on how to use the basic skills, the basic knowledge that we have and transform it into something great and make something great out of it. But I still think that we need to continue to push on the idea of basic fundamental educational reform that our little children need, that the society needs. Otherwise, you're going to have all these people who haven't been educated running. You know, We do need some kind of system a system that is at the fundamental level to give people a basic understanding of how to grow a business, how to run a business, and just how to generally carry themselves uh, 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 in terms of being progressive. I think I think we do need a good structure, and we do need an effort. We do need a, we do need a concerted effort to put forth a curriculum that can be transforming and that can help people um, be more that's for, uh, formally. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you, uh, Dr. Nicolene. Uh, and, and this questions were not part of the original transcript that we had, but uh, as, as we were talking, you guys are throwing out uh, ideas out there that we're using to, to, to generate new questions. When you started, Dr. Nicolene, our specificity, our identity, because the Korean education system is so centralized. Although we do have a, a dual uh, educational system with uh, the Anglo-Saxon and the Anglo-Saxon system uh, copied from our colonial inheritance. I, 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 I would like to ask, that do you think that the educational system, I, I know you said that you should take into consideration and when you mentioned the decentralization, when you're building a curriculum, do you take the environment <laughs> it's uh, it's uh, when you're building a curriculum, do you take into consideration um, that okay, we have a Sahel region, our own farming structure, our strengths are different from the strength uh, uh, of, of those in the east or those in the northwest or the, the savannah region or those in the southwest? When we're do, doing agriculture, are we uh, in, a, in a curriculum with agriculture? Should we take this specific practice? And and we are all products of and I don't know because I just went through school, like going through a tunnel, tunnel system. I, I, I don't understand why. But do you think in the northern part, the education is tailored for people in that region? Yeah, it should be tailored for that region. I remember when I was in Nguakele in the University of Yaoundé, it wasn't really about, the content wasn't really about, it wasn't really applying to the reality of my life or what, what life is. It was just more regurgitating content. And the fastest writer is, the, is probably the best student. If you can write as fast as possible what the teacher is teaching, what the professor is teaching, and get as much content as possible and reproduce that content in the test, 
then you know you're a successful student and so we don't want that kind of education we want education that teaches people skills that people can relate to based on their reality curriculum that reflects the reality of the people in question and i think that that's so fundamental it's something that we're missing and we need to be able to put those discussions on the table about how to create that kind of curriculum that reflects the socioeconomic reality of the people let Garwa or Marwa handle their curriculum based on uh, the, the the cultural values and norms or the reality of the people. Let Bamenda and uh, Limbe handle it, you know, their curriculum based on the reality of the people. And that's important. That, that reflects the authenticity in a people. If you want to be authentic and, and honor the values of the people, it starts with education. So that they can bring in their contributions at the national level and, and the country will be more successful in tapping that human resource potential that comes from that reality. Okay, one last question before I get back to uh, Elizabeth. Uh, uh, Roland, since you're on the ground back home, we do have a you you're in the sector, the area of agriculture. Um, the University of Chang, when he when when he started, this was an agriculture, agricultural university it was supposed to be. Uh, Bill economy and 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 everybody in that agriculture sector. Where where is our university today? Have they transitioned into a more generic university? Or are they still in the field of agriculture? Do you produce people that are ready to be with you in your field and in your capacity? Do you do you see yourself working with a university like this to restructure them to work with you so that when they're coming out of the university, they're already ready to get being productive members of the society. Uh, can, you, can you guys hear me? We can hear you. Great. So, uh, I mean, the aspect of... Uh, University collaboration is something that is still very much missing. And I'll give you my story. Uh, you know, besides uh, me spending time on the farm, I, I spend a lot of time in, in classrooms. Uh, prior to the, the crisis, I used to teach at four different universities at a time in the country. And I lecture in the areas of innovation and entrepreneurship. Um, prior to me being today, I have done quite a lot. Uh, working with uh, U.S. students, U.S. universities and Cameroonian universities and bringing their students together in a common classroom where we could identify problems, create solutions and commercialize them. Um, there's been a lot of that that uh, they would always welcome. But of course, we still have institutions that are still impregnated with a lot of political minds um, and, and, and that, that, that are all get along uh, interest. Uh, I will tell you that for all the universities that I, I taught at, um, uh, I mean, we, we, we never ended up with very, very good relationships because on one side, I went in there with an agenda, which I wanted to permit me to build um, uh, a kind of an experiential learning environment. But of course, uh, those are things that many a times, uh, you know, you, you have to go through several steps for that to be approved, and uh, it, it gets very convoluted within the politics of the school um, and and the school politics, you know. So, of course, uh, there there is still a lot that needs to be done in terms of reforming uh, the schools systems in such a way that they can easily integrate with the private sector, uh, like myself. Um, talking about the University of Chang, um, we had a very interesting. Uh, um, ongoing relationship. You know, when I went to the University of Chan to introduce my technology, um, I met, of course, with the dean at the time. He is somebody who is very open-minded, and he called me in for, for, for a discussion. And when we talked, uh, talk, 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 and we learned about what I was doing, he invited all his other staff members on board. There were seven of them and seven students. And to his greatest dismay, none of them had ever talked to him about the greenhouse technology. And he was of the fact that, but how come this is University of Chang, it is the best university in Western Central Africa in terms of agriculture. And, mm -hmm. and a technology like this, none of you guys have been able to even introduce it or bring it up to us. So you will get to realize that um, at the level of the leadership of the school, 
people. They are welcome into some ideas like this. But of course, those who are actually supposed to take these ideas to administration, to leadership, to those who make the decisions, don't actually drive it. Um, and they will probably sit out there and we believe that, well, maybe the university itself is not willing, but they probably are not in that position where they get a lot of the ideas or they get people like us who want ideas that could be introduced within the universities. But of course, the university went on from there to uh, get the greenhouse technology from myself. And we've been having a lot of working relationships that has led from research, internships, and even a lot of work relationships. Uh, we do a lot of our soil testing at the universities, and there's many more things. But what, do I, what am I trying to say? We have to be pushed on our own end to sell our ideas to the university because, for the most part, uh, they didn't know about it. And those who didn't expect it to bring the ideas to them didn't do well in bringing them. So uh, there's still a, there's a void that, is, that still exists. And I believe that um, it has to be it's a two-way uh, situation for mm -hmm. us to be able to fill that void. We of the civil society needs to be needs to have needs to approach institutions and let them know of the things that we do have. And of course, the institutions also have to be very open and receptive to the ideas that we can bring to them. Thank you. Thank you. That's impressive. And I'm 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 just so glad to hear that you were actually able to reach. I mean, we don't see all of these things on 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 social media or on the newspaper to know that there's a there's actually some relationship that's going on. And I'm hoping that in line of this uh, conversation, they can begin to change their curriculum to, to bring you to lecture so that, like I said, the generation that's coming out of that university, we want to see them starting their own greenhouse. We want to see people being productive and, 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 and being um, less dependent on the concours and, and all of those things. And now the, the next question, uh, my, my host is uh, having a, a cold. It's the cold season out here in, in, in the U.S., so everybody's struggling with, 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 with the cold. So the next question, I, I, and this would be, uh, this could, uh, uh, this would just be a toss up, right? It would be a, a, a perception more so than a question. Do you think that um, a child graduating from the University of Boya comes out thinking that I'm ready to jump into a factory, I'm ready to jump into a company and be an accountant and be a uh, receptionist? Or is the is the, the education in Cameroon tailored in such a way that they have one or two options? Either they write one of the government concours to become a teacher, get into ENAM, get into IRIC, get into one of the different government institutions to survive, or are they looking for an exit out of the country to survive. Um, Dr. Nicolina, I'll have you go with this. Do you, do you think that as the perception that it is right now, the kids have two options. You're looking for an exit strategy or you're getting into the government as opposed to getting into the private sector? Right. I think that when kids graduate from the university, they don't know what they don't know. Meaning that if you don't know how you can use your degree, you don't know how you can use your degree. So then we want to start encouraging students to have a different mindset when they come out of college and also having the resources to teach and train them on how to use their degree. Even if you want to do use your degree, even if one of you, you want to start up something that's not related to your degree, we want to have programs that are available for students to learn how to have the, the a mindset to, to work, how to have the mindset to take action and do things after their degree. And I've noticed actually a lot of young kids are doing well, are coming out and they're starting programs, they're starting mentorship, they're starting organizations. And I think we're giving less credit to them. A lot of students, a lot of people are in Cameroon are actually doing amazing things with what they have. So we want to encourage our students to have that same kind of mindset that when you come out, you don't necessarily need to be thinking about going elsewhere or you don't necessarily need to think about going to the next concours or uh, professional school. But what can you do? Are there resources available uh, to help students and that's where certification comes in that's where having technical education comes in that's where having the 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 resources to help them transition from school to 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 uh the workforce comes in but it has a lot to do with mindset 
and it has a lot to do with um, resources that are available for them to make that transition. But we want to be able to help them to, to see that and to think that way in that line. And I think, um, Roland, I think you're, 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 you're a wonderful example, really, of how personally for me, I graduated in Cameroon, but to be honest with you, I think that is, the infrastructure is so, um, it's, it's for me, it's a difficult landscape. And I really admire people who succeed in it, who do well in it, who have the stamina and the capacity to excel in it. But not everybody has that kind of capacity. Many people have the talent and the skills, but they want to work in a system that is more predictable, a system that is, even if it's not good, at least you know how to flow in it and how to grow in it. So for people like us, it's very difficult to operate in that system. And I think it would be for a lot of students as well who just don't have the stamina or the mindset or the capacity to operate under a system that is so antagonistic and not open to growth of its citizens. Thank you, Dr. Nicolini. And the same, the same question applies to, to you, but let me, let me uh, we cannot, we, that goes without saying that we cannot underlook under the progress that some of this uh, younger generations have, uh, have, have done for themselves. Um, I, 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 I'm on social media a lot. I see a lot of this, this guy, men as, as well as women, starting their own small businesses, clothing lines, uh, fashion collection lines, um, you have makeup collections. So they're becoming more entrepreneurial over time. They're understanding that I need to figure out a way out. Not everybody is going to be able to get into this concours. Uh, not everybody is going to be, out, be able to go out to Europe and, and America or Asia to make a living. So if I'm here, I'm able. But I, I don't know if that number is big enough to, to say everybody in the country is on that same page. And I, I come back to you, Roland, because you are on the ground. You see these things in real day. You, see, you have real data on, on what is happening and the progress that is happening. So it wasn't out here. We, 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 we are, it's only relatable for us. So just shed some light on, on what I talked about, the concour, and what you see on the ground. If people are drifting now away from those concours and trying to go abroad and trying to make a living back locally. <clears throat> You see, um, it, it's it's a very uh, again a very pertinent uh, point uh, we, we you, you're bringing up, and I'll give you a small story of mine. When I was teaching at a Christian university in in, in Bali, uh, so I teach a university wide course, and uh, this time I was actually with a group of final year students, and we are in entrepreneurship class. And I have to ask them the question, why are you doing, why are you studying petroleum engineering? Why are you even in this school in the first place? Why are you doing the thing you do? To be honest with you, I was quite saddened when I realized that most of the students uh, were not there on their own personal drive. Mm -hmm. then you would have students who would say, oh, I, I came to this school because uh, I'm Presbyterian. Oh, I'm doing petroleum engineering because my dad asked me to do so. Oh, I'm doing chemical engineering because I had uh, biochemistry and this, and I didn't know what else I can do. I'm doing this, you know. So one, first of all, is the basis of why people are actually being educated. Mm -hmm. uh, many of us, we go through school in Cameroon without even knowing why we're going to school. We just go to school because it's, it is part of the culture. It's part of the routine that when you're born, you go to school, you get a job, you get married, you have kids, and then, you know, that's it. Uh, we don't even understand, and that's what it comes to the quality of education. We haven't had that. Uh, it is it is it is quite sad. Um, I get a lot of students who come for interviews. Um, looking at even from the way they have resumes, you can tell that uh, they are not ready for. Uh, you know, uh, we still have a, an educational system where, uh, uh, when when a student is ready for internship, it is the school that writes a letter of internship on behalf of the student. You understand, and the, and the school will say, "Okay, please take our students, work with them, blah blah blah." So you you know, it, it comes to a point where the student comes for an internship because the school wants them to do that, not because they actually need that internship, which is different from us in the U.S., where you have the option of looking out for so many jobs, and there's a reason why you go for these jobs. Students here don't even know how to sit for interviews at jobs. I mean, it is it is one of those things that um um. If we have to ask me, it is one of those things that I would say that push has to come from both sides. 
uh, we still have a, a system where students come to a job not because they actually are passionate about that job, but because they just need anything to do for a job. You know, we have we 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 live in an economy where um, education is not what sells; it's certificates that sell. I mean, I remember when we were going to school, we had people in our classes that failed exams and had to repeat classes. I don't know of I have it has been long, it's been a while I have heard of someone repeating a classroom anymore. You know, you now people just go to schools because okay, it is a school that will get you the certificate. And that's really what matters. I mean, there are schools in every corner of the country right now, and everybody is graduating, but you don't find anybody getting any job. And even those who graduate, you don't find them suitable for the job that they have to get. You find someone who graduated with chemical engineering and is looking for a job as a telemarketer. You understand? I mean, of course, at some point you have to look for any job you want to look for. But when they sit for interviews, you are not even convinced that they actually know why they're in for an interview. So uh, to me, it is. Um, it seems almost that we are at a point where we have a problem that um, the current way we are going about it will not solve the problem. I am of that opinion that we need some sort of a radical transformation, some sort of a radical change to really be able to meet up with the challenges that we are facing today in terms of the educational reform or educational curriculum. Um, we have, of course, a government that uh, would say they are working, but maybe they are working slower than the rate at which the population is growing, the rate at which uh, the citizens are in need of education, because education in Cameroon is one of the biggest selling businesses. Believe me, if you come to Douala right now, almost every corner is a school, especially with the uh, you know with we you know especially with the effects of the of the of the crisis we're having in the north and southwest regions. Every corner in in Douala right now, you have a school. And you ask yourself, where are the teachers of these schools coming from? You know, um, everyone who graduates from a university can read and write notes, goes and applies to be a teacher of a university of a. University. And all they do to the students again there is giving them handouts, giving them notes, and enabling them to read, and then have to pass some exam, and then of course um, you get certified, you get a certificate for a degree. And when they go now into the workforce, you realize that um, everything they actually learn, they have to relearn it again all over. I mean, I have to teach. Sometimes I have to teach my employees how to send a basic email. You have to put a subject, you have to address it, you have to put a body, you have to put a signature. I mean, these are things that. You would be surprised that a final year student, someone who's gone to for university for four years, is unable to write a simple email. You understand? And then that should even tell you what more are you able, you have to train them. So we as employers, we get to that point where you have to discard the education that they actually have come up with. You only are able to accept that education because it tells you of the mindset that they have, it tells you how much you've invested in a classroom, but it doesn't tell you of how much you're capable of adding to as a company um, and it's a very big problem that we are facing especially us from the from the private sector for those in the government sector it's almost easier because again you go you have a concu and then there's a routine that you do follow um, you get in a company and there's a way that things have been done and you follow that for us in the private sector we business changes for us every day our models will change and you need people who can adapt to it easily but of course we find that we find ourselves in a situation where you have to train and retrain train and retrain and human, re human resource has become our biggest handicap. We train employees every day, and then you have a competition that counts and takes them. Or you train them every day, and then once they have an opening to write a concours and go for government jobs, they're gone. So it's a very big issue. It is getting to that point where it's about like, hey, maybe you just get people who have not had any, any education, so you have to invest in training them and training them the way you want them to be trained by you. Because sometimes I get students who come with their notebooks to my farm, to my farm and they want to tell me, oh, what I learned in school is not what you're telling me right here. And I'm like, son, listen, this is what we've done. This is out of experience. This is not out of theory. And you will find yourself arguing with a student because for the most part, they learn that this is, has to be done this way, that way, that way, that way. I am doing something, and again, sorry I'm taking a little long for this, but it is something that is so passionate to me because um, human resource is our greatest problem. And I'm not just talking me. A lot of us in the private sector, you will hear about our human resource being a very big handicap because um, you would expect candidates who have left from a university, but you have to come again. You have to train them all over. It has come to a point where we are now dependent on those who went to technical university than even grammar university. 
And it goes on to, uh, to the point where, you remember when, we, you know, our back nowadays, when you had list A, you went to grammar school. Mm -hmm. And when you had list B, you went to technical school. And it was, of course, considered that those who went to technical school were less of, were, were not as bright as those who went to grammar school. And then now we're beginning to realize that we, right now, most of those who went to grammar school are being employed by those who went to technical school. And you realize that most of the unemployment today in the in Cameroon comes from those who went to grammar school. Those who went to technical school are the ones finding their ways and going forward. And they are becoming those who are actually making big monies in corporations today. So there is a lot that has to be done. If you ask me about reform in the education system, I would say that we need to have an overhaul. You know what? Because uh, there is a proverb that says that if we keep washing our hands in the same water and expecting our hands to be clean, it will never be clean. We're using dirty water and expecting that we'll clean our hands and expect clean hands out of dirty water. There is none of that that's happening. We cannot keep, you know, trying to uh, babysit this idea and saying, okay, let's see how. No, if we have to do anything, we kick it all out and do a new uh, education system adapted to the current and growing system. Look at how many young entrepreneurs are in a Silicon Mountain in Boyer. Ask about the ed educational background. Most of them don't even have an education background. But those are the guys with new technologies today. But they need those who graduate from the University of Boya, Yaoundé, and uh, Chang to be able to sell their businesses. But you don't have them. You, you find someone who graduates with a degree in marketing. They are even unable to do your marketing plan for a business. You, you find someone who said, oh, they graduated with sales and this and that. But they are unable to even come up with a sales plan for anything. You have to teach them again all over. So it's like, what is the waste of time? You know, for the amount of money that we use being educated from class one um, all the way to university, imagine if you invested that in the business. Many of us would have done so many things that are greater than we're doing today. So again, um, there is there, there, there needs to be something that has to be done. Um, it would have to take a collective being, I mean, all of us to get it done. Um, we cannot even say it's the government because for the most part, I say the government does not even know what they are not doing, let alone what they are doing. Uh, so we cannot keep expecting that they would be the ones to bring the solutions. We are the ones to bring that solution. And I believe that these conversations that we're having today is a step towards coming up with solutions that would actually work for the Cameroon of tomorrow. Thank you. That was that was pretty impressive, Roland. Um, we, we, we've been, I've been trying to bring back uh, Dr. Tata for the last, I guess, half an hour. You've noticed that we haven't been able to have uh, ask him uh, any kind of questions. Uh, um, and we're having some unbelievable technical difficulties and we're going to keep working. We're going to try working in the background to make sure because there's some <laughs> questions in his domains that I want to ask him, like the next question about STEM. The world is moving into, again, I'm looking at, at education as not uniquely Cameroonian. Like once you have it, you become a global product. You have to be able to interact. We're having a, a conference with, with, with you, Roland, you're 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 in Cameroon right now. Uh, Dr. Nicolini is in California, and uh, and uh, 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 Dr. Tata is in, in in China. If I was able to, that is how we are interconnected. And so we need mm -hmm. an educational system that takes all of this into consideration. And we need to start teaching our kids science, technology. You talked about. Uh, 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 grammar education. I'm a product of that. I, I I was more into my soccer, and my parents thought, "Oh no, this one is not going to do good in Sacred Heart and Saint Leeds and all of those places." And he sent me into a, they sent me to a technical education, uh, Regina Patches, to study accounting. They come to find out that was the best thing that ever happened to anybody, right? Because accounting is needed over history, anytime, any day, anywhere. Companies need people with that kind of background, and we also need to change the mindset of our parents. So in light of that, Dr. Nicolini, a lot of countries around the world are pushing, they're changing their educational structures from learning sociology, anthropology into STEM. Their kids are learning uh, science, math, technology. They're having laptops as young as the age of five and they're doing complicated situations on there. Other countries in Africa are beginning to push that. but are we still teaching our kids to learn how to pass the GC ordinary levels and the GC advanced levels? Is that where Cameroon is gearing towards? Or are we are we adapting to a modern structure? And at what pace do you think we are we are moving towards that? The government recently approved of 
uh, 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 about how many billions to provide laptops for uh, some Chinese laptops for, for university students and I guess some 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 college uh, level students. Do you think that, that that's doing enough at addressing or they need to start at a very basic level of nursery school to start introducing these kids to math and science and technology? Yes, absolutely. And I want to <laughs> let uh, Roland know to take heart about children, the students not being ready um, to perform when you need them to. This happens all over the world. This is the, the era of the, the fast technology students who are graduating, many of them, even in the U.S., they're not ready for the workplace. Employers have a very difficult time um, with them on the job. They're always on their phones. They're browsing their phones during work, and they're not ready for the rigors of the workplace. And so you're not alone. Many students, even in the U.S., graduate and they work with McDonald's or they do Uber, and they're not using uh, the, the degree that they've learned in school. So it's not unique to Cameroon, it's the current generation. Uh, 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 that's how they operate, they're just not ready. But um, the, yeah, you're right about that. The curriculum, I mean, we can talk all we want and not see the role of the government in refining the curriculum. We need a basic startup. We need a basic infrastructure to go off on, which is refining the curriculum to reflect the current realities of the global market. Students in Cameroon, with the resources they have, cannot compete with students in Singapore. They cannot compete with students in Hong Kong because they have high-end technology. Every day was tossing <clears throat> in my school, tossing computers. Students have access to computers. All of the programs are on the computer. It's rare to see students use books anymore. And we actually encourage students to get on the computer at least half of the day. Um, and those are the students that our children in Cameroon will be competing with. But without that access, Dr. Acha, when he was up here earlier, he mentioned that Cameroon dedicates 16% of his GDP to education. It needs to be more so that we can afford to buy more computers for our students, put them on computer programs. When you want to, when you're applying for a job in Google and you go to Google, they're not asking you for what you've learned in school. They want to see what you can do, not what you know. So they bring a computer and set it in front of you and they ask you to solve a problem with that computer. And that's what students these days are, are being asked to do. And if our students are not exposed to that kind of technology, then they're not gonna be able to compete at a global level. So the question goes back to is, who is going to provide that technology? Who is going to make access uh, of that technology to our students? That's the question I want to ask. Maybe you guys know the answer. I don't. I, I would. I would think, like uh, Roland has said, in partnership with the government, because when when um, when uh, Dr. Tata did his introduction, he did mention that the Canadian government spent sixteen point four percent of their budget on education, whereas uh, com countries like Ghana spend over forty percent of their uh, uh, GDP on education. So. You would need to answer your question. You would need uh, a partnership between the government and the private sector to be able to come in hand in hand to do something. I don't know if uh, Roland wants to chime in. Sure, sure. Um, <clears throat> if we look at countries like Ghana, you will realize that uh, there has been a lot of investments in, uh, in, 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 in education. And it is not only investments coming from the government. The private sector has been so involved, so, so involved in education. Um, and that's what we need to be doing. We need to be introducing educational programs that will seek to reform or seek to add on to what is going on. We have to understand that we have a system that is uh, that needs an overhaul. And what needs to be done is you cannot totally discard it. Uh, the way the philosophers would say is that we have to clean the bathtub without throwing the baby out. Um, the way that happens is that we have to be able to bring new ideas while we, we start to shift the older ideas or start to make the other ideas look old. And that's what needs to happen. 
um, look at a lot of the uh, innovative programs that you've had, um, like in Ghana, you have in South Africa, you have in Kenya. Uh, a lot of these things, uh, they, they are beginning to uh, show a new way of learning, which means that, um, of course, in a place like Cameroon, there is the, 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 you know, the laws that change to favor creation of private institutions. The only problem is that most of those private institutions that have been created do not also follow suit. You know, they come in and they get distracted or get attracted by just getting the school fees and uh, enabling to just teach, you know, students whatever they want to teach and let them go. I think we need to have a system in place that holds people accountable or holds the institutions accountable to make sure that they're actually teaching the right things to the students. Because mm -hmm. students want to learn. Uh, don't get me wrong. People, this guy doesn't want to learn. But we've now created a system where, okay, you know what, my school is that which you can just come in, get a degree and leave, you know, pay your school fees. As long as you pay your school fees, nothing else matters to us. So I think that, you know, especially for us in the private sector, we need to be able to be accountable to make sure that we are teaching the right things to the students that we take school fees from. And to me, it is very, very important um, mm -hmm. that we see how that system is being created and it could be created and supported by the government to make sure that it has been enforced and reinforced um, for our own good. Right. It, it, it appears that we were operating in a system of survival where it's survival of the fittest, where it is what it is, just make something out of it. And so that's where we are. And um, uh, he, you make a good point, Roland. We have to hold people accountable and people have to hold themselves accountable. I think that we need some kind of ethics and empathy in the people in leadership and teachers, people who are teaching, to have some empathy, to have some desire to see growth in students. But then again, people are operating based on the knowledge that they have. If they don't know how to do it, they don't know how to do it. If they haven't been exposed themselves, then they, they can only teach what they know. So again, it goes back to training. We need more training, more resources to expose people to educational uh, 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 strategies that will make a significant difference for our students. Okay, we're, we're, we're gonna move to the next segment. Um, uh, and, uh, before we end, we're gonna ask recommendations that um, that's the next uh, part of the, 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 the conversation. But before we get to that, we're gonna ask the, the audience to start asking their questions to either Dr. Nicolene. Again, we're still working uh, in the background to try to see how we can get Dr. Tata, uh, who has a lot of rich experience in this field to also get back. Um, the, the software is a little slow right now. It's not very responsive. And I think I also equally just I lost- we lost uh, Roland. Yeah. So. Um, it's just him, you and uh, and myself. So uh, we'll continue working in the background to make sure they just did an update on their software. So it's it's also the first time that we were doing a test run on this. Okay. So there was a question that came in, and I and I, I would like to ask you since you're the only one left on board. I I hope everybody can come back. Um, is the current educational system fit for the needs of the country at this time? Well, I think we've already addressed that in so many ways that it's not. We need more access to technology. Our students need more access to computers. And I think that for the people who are in the diaspora who want to help, there are a lot of people in the diaspora who want to help. Sending computers home will be a good way to help. And if you can provide some resources as to who will teach the students how to use the computers. I think Cameroon has good access to Wi-Fi. I think okay, so. Okay. I know that that question sounds very simple, but let me let me let me let me, let me make it a little interesting, mm -hmm. right? What is the need of Cameroon at this current time? Then we can talk about addressing adding the educational sector to it. Because if we say no, it doesn't. Sending laptops. Because if you're sending laptops, what are you addressing with the laptops, right? Having Wi-Fi and all of that stuff. So, can we understand what is needed to frame an educational system that befits that need? So can we talk about the need in the 21st century? I think the need is access to technology. That's the need. It's access to technology. 
okay, what are we going to do with this technology? I mean, this is a country that oh. uh, 60%, 70% of its revenue comes from agriculture, right? I don't think that the uh, uh, technological revolution is, is going to be big in Cameroon, right? So we are looking at a more, uh, what, when Roland comes on, uh, our, that's, uh, uh, our, our background, our economy is heavily reliant on, on agriculture. Mm-hmm. Is that not what we should focus on as well as mm-hmm. a, a technology, right? But technology is not going to be the future of Cameroon in the next 20, mm-hmm. 30, 40 years. It's going to be a push for agriculture. So can, we, can you see that if we are sending laptops to kids in primary school, Mm-hmm. Are we are we not um, putting the horse the cart before I, the horse? I, okay, good. I get your point now. Um, no, and not everybody can be a farmer, and not everybody will be in agriculture. So we need to prepare our students for other careers and other uh, opportunities. So I think that at the elementary level. And we need to stop teaching general subjects. We need to just stop teaching everything. Stop teaching history or geography or those kinds of subjects just to fill the curriculum. We need to teach literacy. And Roland mentioned a statistic about, I think, 80% of students not being literate, but they've gone to school. We need to really focus on literacy. We need to focus on science and also on math and pay emphasis on those three subjects that will give students the foundation to to up level from that point on you know what i mean really um effectively uh shifting the curriculum to focus on specific things not just filling filling it with redundant subjects just for the purpose of regurgitating and being educated so we Thank need to you. increase literacy math and science that is relevant Thank- to the current economy, but they do need they do need the resources. They need the, the right books, the right content, and I'm not sure you know who provides the content. Um, if they're, they're authors, maybe Roland would have addressed that for us. But are there Cameroonian authors who write those books? Do we get those books from abroad? But that content is relevant, uh, and it needs to be updated to reflect the current reality, and then we can build from there. Okay. Thank you. And um, let me uh, try to see how we can, because we've lost Roland. I um, I cannot see him. We've lost Elizabeth and we've not been able to get uh, everybody. Dr. Tata. So it's just me and you. So I would uh, ask the, the audience to indulge with us, bear with us for a mm-hmm. brief moment. Let's uh, work, work through this uh, technical hiccup and see how we can bring uh, all of these guys back. I don't know what happened to Roland's feed. Maybe we can take some questions from the audience. Right. Uh, if the if the audience are willing to start sending questions while we're doing this, we'll appreciate it. Uh, uh, Romeo is at, Romeo Romeo Jaka asks, uh, "What has worked in Ghana is investment in education. Uh, this is this is the only this is the only way it works." So I guess it's not a question, but it's uh, it's an emphasis that Ghana is investing more in education, and and that is what works. The government, and I'm saying Ghana. I guess he's saying Ghana. He's talking about the government of Ghana and the, and the mm-hmm. private sector. They've in, they've invested so much, and it's working. So Cameroon needs to invest uh, heavily on education and education that matters, not just not like you said a generic brand of education. Mm-hmm. Uh, let me let me go through this and see uh, any other questions. Uh, Clifford uh, Ndechem is saying this is a this is good. However, he would have loved to see some panelists who are directly involved in education in Cameroon or in decision making process. I love the profile of all these panelists, but I think it's more of a taxation without representation panel. And just to answer that, uh, uh, Clifford, uh, the, the, the big debate did reach out to stakeholders in, in Cameroon to participate. We went out, we actually did uh, 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 outreach as we did to uh, Dr. Nicoline and Roland and, and even people like um, uh, Dr. Tata who saw us unexpectedly on social media reached out to us and said, hey, I want to be part of this show. This is something very important. 
we did reach out to stakeholders in Cameroon, and you know what happens in Cameroon, people are scared to speak up. Uh, we, we don't panda with our questions here. We ask tough questions. We ask implicating questions. So those in Cameroon did not want their faces to appear. And a lot of them actually sent replying emails that, hey, this is not the right time with the sociopolitical issues going on for you to be talking. They don't want to be seen as if they're taking a swipe at the government. So we did reach out. But unfortunately, um, we the the the. The, the, the response was not what we, we expected, but we are more than pleased with having uh, experts like Dr. Nicoline, Dr. Tata, who has unfortunately not been able to participate, and guys like Roland who are on the ground and, and giving us real-time data. Right. And just to add to that, um, you mentioned those of us who are on here right now, we actually do, did do research, I actually called people in Cameroon. My friend who's a judge graduated from INAM, I called her to ask questions. My friend who works with the Minister of Education, who's in the field of education, has been a teacher. I called her and asked questions. So ideas are never wasted. Ideas are never wasted. When we have conversations, there's one thing we always learn from each other. So we just can't completely just discard the panel because we've done our work and we've done our, re our research as well. Okay. So um, I think it's because I, I cannot re re reboot the thing. All of them, I, I think all of them are connected. It's just not coming up in my feed, so I can't bring them up. And unfortunately, I cannot reboot the, restart the link because it's just going to kick us all of us out. I think we'll have to make do with with the current situation. Um, I don't think there's much that it offers me to do again. I've tried every uh, everything possible, and it's not. It's just not. It's just not working. So, uh, Dr. Nicoline, uh, we're just going to round it up yourself and me. Uh, could you could you give some recommendations on how the current system can be improved? And I know we've touched sporadically on, on, on all of this, uh, measures have been thrown out, but let's just focus right now on those measures. Uh, can you give us some recommendations on how the current system can be improved and some measures that can be put in place to reform the system, like immediately, like short term and then long term? Hmm. Short term. I mean, long term, I think the government has to be a willing participant in how to reform the system. But it's obvious like it's obvious that they're not interested. They're not interested in sitting down for a debate and they're not interested in receiving proposals and recommendations that experts have sent in about how to revamp the curriculum. But that said, um, in an ideal world, we do need increased in vocational training. Um, for our students, we also do need to do need to strengthen the educational system with a focus on preparedness, science, and technology as well. And we do need accountability, which is what uh, Roland was mentioned for those of those who are in the field who are teaching. Uh, being accountable, just being more doing, striving every day to be a better teacher, striving every day to be a better worker, a better mentor, a better manager doing all you can for personal growth, personal transformation. The better you are, the better you can help someone else. So we need to every day at our own level, uh, be the best that we can be, refine our thinking, refine our thoughts, read more books, expand our thinking. I mean, there's Google now. Anything you need to know, you can find it on Google. Um, we can learn a lot just by, by going onto Google. So our mindset needs to shift. You're asking the question about what we can do right now is we have to start with personal transformation and transforming ourselves, transforming our mindset, learning a lot, reading outside of the classroom, reading books on entrepreneurship, reading books on personal development, reading books on how to grow uh, in your field of expertise and just taking charge of our own personal lives and elevating ourselves when you're elevated in your thinking, when you're elevated in your skills, you can then pass that on to the younger generation and you can serve with authenticity and you can serve with expertise. Does that make sense? And I think that's a good, that's a good place to start. Um, unfortunately, many of us, Roland mentioned it at the top of the program, many of us stick more to blame and to point fingers and we have to start being better people ourselves. We have to look at ourselves in the mirror and improve our own skills through personal education. Because if the government is not gonna provide it for you, how else are you going to learn it? 
you have to use technology, you have to go online on Google and research things for yourself and learn how to improve and be better so that you can impact someone else positively. And it, it takes a lot um, personally to do that. Um, you have to find time. Uh, I mean, it, it, these things that I'm sharing doesn't seem like a, a, an effective or classic educational solution, but they are. Personal transformation in business is real. And that's what Tony Robbins is making thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars, millions of dollars, helping people to transform their mind by what he calls neuro-linguistic programming, where you need to reprogram your mind to think differently, to see differently, and to, and, to gen and to have skills that will help you be a better person so that you can change the world you live in. And that's what we need. We need to go on Google and research those ideas and research different things and be better people so that we can help um, the children who are coming up and those that we're supervisors over and leaders over. Does that make sense? It does, and thank you for that. And 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 one of those uh, other questions, and and Roland Roland would have also been able to contribute here heavily, but unfortunately, we still can't bring him back. Uh, yeah. He talked about the difficulties of recruiting workforce that is ready to 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 join the 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 employment market as it is. Um, and he talked about he thinks it's about time that we go back into and just recruiting guys from the technical education sector because those from the uh, general education sector are just too uh, 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 academic and they're not they don't have the practical uh, uh, need of the market do you think it's time that we rejuvenate and promote technical education back in the days we used to have home bear I think we still have home bear that we used to say uh, carpenters and plumbers and electricians were coming out that were ready to join the workforce and start being productive members of society. Do you think it's time that uh, the educational system takes interest and focus on, 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 on those sectors of the economy? Absolutely. And we used to have government technical uh, colleges, remember? And those yeah. have just been dilapidated. They're not, they've been replaced by government uh, bilingual. And everybody has been lost. Um, it's uh, unfortunate that uh, we are having this issue. And uh, it's this is a very important topic. I think we would have to take this debate over once we've sorted out uh, what's going on with uh, the issue with the software. We do heavily apologize to the viewers, to the fans. Um, it's 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 really sad, and uh, I I apologize on behalf of the of Tim Big debate that uh, the software has not left uh, lived up to expectation. So I would have to terminate the broadcast, and I think the team and myself will have to review and 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 do a, 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 a an assessment of when we can redo this. Uh, this episode. Once more, we apologize and good night.